Hello everyone, this is Terry with Futures.io, and as always, I would like to thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to welcome back Futures Trader 71 for today's webinar, The Challenges of Trading in Isolation. Throughout the webinar, if you have a question, please feel free to type them into the questions box. We'll do our best to answer them at the end of, or by the end of the event. This webinar will be recorded and posted on the Futures.io website within 24 to 48 hours. If you're watching us afterwards on YouTube, please do us a favor, give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed the webinar. And as always, please feel free to share, comment, subscribe to our channel. It really helps us a lot. For trading news, events, and information, you can follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter using at Futures.io. And now, without further delay, I'll hand it over to FT, and you'll get to pop up to share your screen again. Thank you. All right, looks good. She's all yours. Thanks, Terry. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, hopefully, you've had a successful trading day today. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the challenges of trading in isolation. And as someone said, this is one of those topics that's uh, more of a uh, take your medicine kind of topic, generally not so, um, seeming not so important, but uh, it's, it's, these, it's these things, it's these particular topics that really make a difference when it comes to trading. You know, talking about risk management and uh, performance analysis, things like that, uh, traders tend to gravitate to tools and setups and things. Uh, you might find something useful in this. That's my hope. I'm spending time with you here and you with me in the hope that uh, we would both walk away with something. I want to remind everyone that derivatives trading involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. What are we going to cover today? Uh, I want to just quickly go over the typical online trader's journey. Uh, I've been uh, trading for about, uh, this will be my 20th year, uh, Q4 this year, and I've been uh, in contact with online traders for the last uh, 12 years or so. Uh, it's been an interesting journey. I'm going to go over the typical online trader's journey, see if it aligns with yours. I'm also going to talk about what's in it for you in terms of trading in isolation the upside of doing so, the downside of doing so. Uh, what is the big edge that tra uh, for trading firms? What do they have as an edge that uh, may not uh, be attainable for the typical trader, online traders? And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the caveats, trading in a group, and then things we can do uh, to get the most out of belonging to a tribe or a group of traders. Digging right in. Typical online trader's journey, generally, just like it was for me, uh, we find out about uh, the market through someone who's speculating and talking about it. Uh, generally, they're, um, you know, they're trading something or they've made money, so they're telling the world about it. We happen to be with an earshot, and we get interested. Uh, we're lured in generally by uh, the, the the lure of profits, financial freedom, fancy cars, independence. Uh, this is all overwhelming to us, so we decide to take whatever steps are necessary to um, to open an account and, uh, and get going, right? To maybe even uh, start to think about uh, what it's gonna be like the day we put in our notice uh, to, to resign from our job. <laughs> and accounts funded and the first stage of competence kicks in. This is the first stage, uh, unconscious incompetence. I mean, at the end of the day, how hard could trading be, right? It's pretty easy. This guy's doing it. I should be able to do it. Of course, whoever brought you into trading uh, may not have given you the full picture, uh, shared with you the, uh, shared with all of us the, uh, the turmoil, the pain, the losses, uh, and how they're doing overall. They're, you know, generally people talk about their best days and kind of um, don't refer back to their worst. A few punches to the gut later, you know, we have our account open and we're in there dabbling every day. A few punches to the gut later, we realize that we need to learn more. This is the second stage of competence. This is where it begins. We know this. there's more to it than what we're seeing. We try to learn and follow whatever anyone tells us. This is the information accumulation phase. Uh, we'll spend a good part of our career uh, undoing a good portion of this phase because uh, we're just trying everything, we're checking everything out, we're jumping from methodology to methodology. Oh, this guy is using uh, Heiko, whatever bars, 
this guy's using fibs. Let me look at fibs. Oh, this one is using patterns. Let me check out patterns. This guy's trading a stock versus a future. Let me check that out. And we spend a ton of time going through that learning curve, the yes curve again and again and again. That's very typical of the second stage of competence. This is the stage that takes the longest amount of time to get through. After a lot of money and time is spent, when we realize that we really need to own this process and get more mechanical about it. Now, I've given many talks in Futures IO. I've known Big Mike for, geez, eons, probably 12 or 15 years. Um, and I've come on here and talked a lot about each one of these aspects, you know, the, the stages of learning, uh, the process. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't matter what you trade, where you trade, how you trade. It, you need to own that process. We all need to own our trading process individually. We rely on others to give us the ideas uh, and to seed our thoughts into where we should focus. Everything and nothing works in trading. And so uh, we start to come up with a deliberate focus, uh, to come up with a deliberately focused uh, process and this is where we start to undo what we did and stay what we learned in stage two, the second stage of competence. Uh, we start to unlearn that. We start to shed away the things that we hold on to, all the different lines on the chart that really uh, give us confirmation bias, maybe uh, all the all the habits that we picked up that uh, don't serve us. You know, we're not able to wait wait for a proper setup that we've met that we've. Um, prop you know we've tested out we've studied but that that setup's not coming along we're bored so we decide to scalp in between and next thing we know uh our setup shows up we can't take it because we're sitting here defending a bad trade we start to see a glimmer of hope this is the third stage we're here for a while this is called conscious competence we are consciously doing things to get better uh and we're becoming more and more competent our process works and things start to flow. Trading is now mundane. It's a process. It's a job. Uh, and we're thoughtless about executing. This is the fourth stage. This is the expert stage. This is a stage we want to get into. And by the way, except for stage one, we tend to flow in and out of these stages. I may be in stage four for a while. The market regime changes and I'm no longer able to buy dips and just sleep. Um, I need to be more active. The market may be in a sideways uh, balance zone or, or um, you know, holding pattern, uh, and I'm getting a lot of false, uh, false pullback, uh, pullback trades. Uh, I'm getting chopped up, and I need to fall back on stage three or even stage two. Uh, and, and this process kind of goes back and forth throughout our career. We call those rough patches. Um, so this is a stage we want to end up in. This is pretty much uh, the same path that everybody walks. Uh, we all walk it at different uh, speeds with different tools and different circumstances, different amount of money, and so on and so forth. Some, for some individual traders, these stages, stages can take months. For many individual traders, these take years, you know, two, three years to actually really start to kind of fit you know, fit nicely in our in our process, fit comfortably in our shoes, uh, so to speak. Would it be sustainable for a financial institution to allow us to take years to learn to be proficient just like we do as private traders? So I'm gonna ask everybody to take a moment here and just type in the number of months uh, with a number with an M or a number with a Y for years since you first got introduced to trading. If you could take a moment and just type that into the uh, chat box in front of you, how many years or months have you been doing this? So we have four years, seven years, six years, four years, 11 years, 12 and a half years, 30 years. Wow. Whew. We should send you, I think uh, Futures IO should send you a gold <laughs> Rolex or something. Um, six years, eight months, seven years. There's a huge variety here and it's, it's an incredible uh, it's an incredible uh, 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 resource. Uh, someone here is saying they first began in 1985, uh, uh, got good two years ago. 
since 1985. Holy cow, that's a long time. Uh, so what is that, 35 years, something like that. Uh, so there's there's a, a huge variety here. Uh, and what if what if this resource can be harnessed, right? What if this resource can be brought together uh, and could we could feed off this resource in a focused way. Now, the second thing I want to ask you is this question at the bottom of the screen here. Is it sustainable? Now, remember, there are people out of, we, I didn't ask how many years have you been trading and how many years have you been profitable? Uh, those are, you know, two different things. Uh, I didn't want to make it, uh, make it noisy. It's hard to track all the answers, but, but, uh, for many, profitability is a very, very seductive but very elusive uh, quality. And so what I want to ask you is, for the number of years, if you've spent more than a year trading and you're not profitable, let's say, I'm not singling anybody out, is it sustainable for a financial institution to hire a trader, they call it a prop shop, a trade desk, and so on, and allow someone to be to learn for 35 years or for 20 years or 10 years or even six years or even three years? Is it sustainable, right? Yet a huge number of people that I've been exposed to over the years as, as, uh, as somebody who uh, was part of starting a brokerage in the middle of starting a new brokerage right now, uh, who managed risk, uh, monitored risk, somebody who's also back traders uh, for myself, for my firm from 2000 and uh, what is it, three, late 2003 through 2010. Um, it, it's not sustainable to do this for a very long time. Uh, and for the most part, you've got nine months to show something or uh, the seat needs to be emptied for someone else. Yet for most traders, they'll do this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years and not get results. A lot of times I've received a lot of emails in my Futures Trader 71 website from people asking for help because it's starting to affect their marriage, their financial situation, and so on. And they don't want to give up because they've. it's kind of like being in a trade that isn't working. They don't want to give up on something they've already invested so much time into. Uh, and what I'm doing with this particular webinar here is hopefully giving you a bit of a light bulb, shedding some light on really what's needed uh, in order to have as close a, uh, a turnaround uh, as possible, in my opinion, as say a financial institution. We wanna get this done and get it done quickly. We wanna find out as quickly as possible that we can't do this. Now, I don't believe that anybody's talented. I don't believe in talent. I believe you have a, you're predisposed to taking interest and working on something uh, and putting your effort into something in a, in a deliberate way. And therefore you'll see results. Uh, I don't think anybody's born uh, with a basketball and, and can get Michael Jordan's numbers um, or the late Kobe Bryant's or whatever. It's, it's, it's something we learn. It's a deliberate thing that we learn uh, to, to pick up a skill and learn. And so all of us are able to succeed in trading, uh, in my opinion, but also we're all susceptible to over leveraging, to losses, to, uh, to blowing up. And one of the biggest resources that we have to preserve is not the the, is not really the cash in our account, even though younger people believe that that's really what matters. Um, it's time. We want to make the most out of the time that we have and financial institutions, for financial institutions at time is directly correlated with money and that's why it doesn't, they don't allow for someone to sit around for a long, long time to make turn, right? For many people, it takes three, four years to actually finally see what they're doing wrong. So let's get into it. What's in it for you? So isolation or trading alone? Um, what's the upside of trading in isolation? We cannot define the upside to trading in isolation or the downside to trading in isolation without taking a step back 
and looking at the, the, the attributes and the character traits of that trader, right? For some, trading in isolation is the best environment, right? For others, it is the worst environment. So the question that has, there some of the questions that need to be asked, and this is a short list of the criteria you used to use to back traders, things that I needed to find out about the applicant uh, or the recruit before they were backed. You know, have you shown discipline? Are you a disciplined person? Are you able to sustain doing something for a long time, even though you may not see results? Very important skill to have, especially if you're going to be, if we're going to go at this alone, very, very important skill to have. Am I methodical as a person? Do I follow a process? Do I outline a process? Is it logical? Am I an objective person? Or do I bring emotion and anxiety to what I struggle with? In other words, when I'm taking something on, part of the process is for me to get stressed out, for me to stress myself out. That's when I perform best. There are people who wait to as close a deadline to a deadline as possible before actually doing the work because that's when they get the most out of their effort. Um, you know, uh, do we bring a lot of emotion and anxiety to what we're doing? The emotions cannot be uh, eliminated, but they have to be recognized and, and dealt with. We cannot respond to emotions, uh, and that requires discipline, right? So if we don't have discipline, we're emotional, it's a tough gig trading. Uh, so do I generally look to see what I want to believe? In other words, am I someone who's consistently justifying what I believe or wanting to believe something and therefore I project it and only see that one thing that I want to believe. I believe I have a great system. So I've been, say, testing a trading system, an automated system, and, and everything about it is amazing. And, and heck, I don't even need risk parameters. Let me go live with it and boom, it explodes uh, because we're not being objective. So these all impact how isolation or trading alone may work for each of us. We need to know ourselves really well. Now, if you're trading in isolation and you're not seeing results, it's time to look around. Um, and there are many, many ways to do that. I'll discuss how, uh, you know, how I'm doing it. Given that a person has the attributes of grit, discipline, fact-based deductive reasoning, the will to explore a variety of novel angles, you have to be, you have to come to the market with a unique view on the the asset that you're trading. How we're looking at the market has to be somewhat unique for us to have an edge. Isolation may be a very workable environment under these uh, characteristics, right? Grit, discipline, fact-based deductive reasoning. In other words, I'm just like a detective or a lab technician. I'm just taking the facts. Uh, isolation is a workable environment for this type of character and this person, this trader may see uh, positive results from this. Persons with these attributes tend to do better working alone. They prefer deep, what's called deep work, where it is quiet and, and uh, they don't need anyone else's um, live input for the most part. Okay, are you one of those people? Otherwise, you know, the down, downside of trading in isolation the serious drawback trading alone or in isolation is that most traders tend to not have the attributes needed to do well, okay? Uh, many, many, many of us uh, do better in a group as a team. Uh, without someone to bounce ideas off of, uh, to share alerts with and views, we find ourselves trading in a vacuum. Uh, this describes a, just a huge proportion of online traders. This is where uh, services like Futures.io make a difference. Uh, you know, the, the goal here is to bring people together as it is for convergent trading, for example, which I started two years ago. People have a very strong social and tribal component. We all do. Uh, we are pack animals. We have always done better going, going at it as a group. We are such social animals, even in our successes, that we tend to highlight those who go it alone as heroes. So when we see someone going it alone and they succeed, we tend to really raise uh, that person or character to some sort of a hero status. It's something that is really unexpected uh, for, for us as human beings that uh, somebody can take on something really difficult and, and uh, succeed at it uh, you know, tremendously alone. And Rockefeller is a good example. 
uh, people refer to Rockefeller, you know, the uh, Rockefeller, a recent thing I read, they said, if you took Rockefeller's, um, you know, he was, uh, he was an oil tycoon. Um, if you took Rockefeller's net worth back when he died, which was 1936 or 37, uh, he died, I think he was 98 years old, very long life. Um, and, and adjusted for inflation, he's still uh, almost twice as wealthy as the wealthiest man in the world today. Uh, this, this is a, an icon in, in, in a capitalist society. So this is someone who went at it on his own. He's a very stubborn individual. Um, the largest drawback to trading alone or in isolation is the lack of accountability. This is a big piece, and I'll talk about this more a little bit later. Traders who don't have accountability tend to take longer to do what is necessary to make it, in our opinion. So I've seen this. People just don't make the adjustments necessary if they're not accountable to anybody. Does this ring a bell to anyone? Does this, are you, are you one of these people that feel like, man, I could do this, but I keep screwing up, but hey, there's always tomorrow. I can always come back tomorrow and uh, and try again right because there is no accountability are you accountable who's accountable here to someone is anybody here accountable to anyone in your trades you can just type in the uh, chat box in front of you are you accountable good some are Oof, accountable to the wife it's tough it's tough boss uh the biggest component missing for the online traders that nobody's watching right this isn't the case in an institution. What is the big edge for trading firms? Remember, I ran a trading firm um, back traders. It's a different environment. It's how I came into trading. I came into trading as an equities trader, as part of a group uh, in, in Florida, and then I switched um, to futures as part of a group, and then I traded as part of the gr a group, and then later started backing people as part of a group, uh, physical or online. For this reason, it makes business uh, for a trading firm, whether tr a true prop or institutional, I'm um, talking about true prop, that is you're backed as a full employee, you don't pay anything to do it. Uh, this is true prop. Uh, whether you're back to whether you're a true prop or institutional inherently makes an investment in the trader they hire. This goes back to the question earlier. This ties back to that question about, you know, would an ins financial institution give as much time or allow a trader to take as much time uh, as many of us have seen or do uh, in, in, in our own account privately. For this reason, it makes business sense to invest in the best equipment, services, connections, data, intelligence. This is what financial institutions do. You're not going to take any shortcuts. You're going to spend as much as, uh, as much as you need to for the best bandwidth, the best uh, computers, the best news feeds, the best um, trader psychology um, services, the best data, the best intelligence reports, research, and so on. This is a large component to the edge for trading firms, right? So immediately we, for those of you who used to, who have watched uh, the show uh, on Showtime called Billions uh, about Axe Capital, you can see like they had, they had that uh, Wendy Rhodes, who was the, the, the therapist, uh, and, and kind of focused on traders and trader performance. And then you had, you know, the best, uh, uh, the best equipment, you had the, the best bribes, <laughs> the best whatever. And this is true, uh, other than the bribing part, I can't attest to that. Um, this is true for, for uh, financial institutions. You have to make that investment. But this is not the biggest component, in, in my opinion. This is not the biggest component. For me, there's a bigger edge than that. And that is when trading with others as opposed to alone, a hidden component is in play and it consists of competition, okay? So here, uh, hang on. One second. Competition. So it's, it's really important for traders to uh, to to see that if Jane over there trading the same product as I, maybe I'm trading gold or crude or the Dow or corn, uh, if she's making money, then I can beat her. There's a there's a competitive thing that occurs. 
uh, when we're trading in a in a financial institution. There are bonuses that are dependent on that. And not only do you get to keep your job, but there's a bigger share of the profits. For example, for prop traders, as you make more money in the year, the cut goes from 50-50 to 60-40 to 70-30, and it maxes out 80-20, for example. There's a competition. Who's going to get there first? So there's this fire under our behinds to move forward with improvement. There's belief, uh, knowing I can see that people are doing it. I can see that people are making money. You know, many people here today probably believe eh, nobody's really making money, including the guy talking. Um, so, so I don't even know. I've never seen anybody who makes money at this. So why should I believe? Heck, I'm doing this for entertainment. Why should I believe that you can make money trading anything, let alone futures, right? Derivatives. I can see that people are, are doing it in a financial institution. Uh, and so my attitude, my belief structure changes. Once we believe, things start to work a little bit better, in my opinion. Then there's the accountability factor. These are the biggest, I think, most valuable components to trading within a group or an institution. Some, somebody who's got an investment in us um, this is what this was. This is the collateral uh, kind of benefit that comes out of it. Accountability. I need. To, I need to do this, and I need to do this now. Otherwise, I'm gone. Otherwise, I'm going to be fired. Uh oh, my boss is coming out. It looks like she's heading in my direction. Um, you know, am I going to get fired this time because I lost my limit yesterday again? You know, there's that doesn't exist when we're trading alone, and it's our own account. We're not accountable to anybody. There's the collateral data component, things happening in other markets that we feed from. For example, in a prop room, it's really useful for, uh, for example, if somebody's trading, if I'm in the DAX, right? I used to trade the DAX heavy, uh, the Euro stocks, um, the Dow sometimes. And if somebody's trading the Bund or the 10 years or the ES or the NQ, uh, they may say, you know, they, they may say something like, oh, look out, 10-year auction in, in, in 60 seconds, right? That might give me pause, may, maybe not. But that's information I otherwise wouldn't have. Or somebody is trading the Dow and I'm in the DAX, or I may also be in the Dow and they say, oh man, here it is, this is it, this is the level. This is a multi uh, time frame level. We have, uh, you know, we have a, a big, a big uh, area here, they don't talk like this, they're a little bit more <laughs> focused, but they may say, hey, look, we're at 28,790, this is huge, this is a weekly, monthly, daily level, plus there's a fib here, plus there's this, plus there's that. It's data that people kind of speak out in a group that helps, this is collateral data. Uh, the other thing is there are different feeds, there are different kind of rumor mills, there are different um, ways to get information that doesn't exist when we are trading in isolation. Uh, and then the last thing, of course, uh, and also equally important, is the open exchange of ideas. When we belong to a group, a tribe, whether that tribe is an employer or a, an online service or whatever it is, uh, people tend to be much more open with what what we do. We tend to share our tools. We tend to share our ideas. Uh, this helps remove stagnation and helps us uh, keep growing, right? So there's this continuous kind of ingrained uh, trader development that, uh, that is done organically. What are the caveats to trading in a group? Things you need to be aware of, in my opinion. A few items to pay attention to when trading in a group or with others. Define everyone's time frame. I cannot tell you how many times I would say something, um, even in the convergent, uh, convergent chats, uh, head trader channel, where I say, uh, yeah, this is, this is a tough area here. This is a tough area if you're long into it, good area to scale in my opinion. And then I'd get a PM saying, yeah, I don't see that. I don't see that. I'm going to hold right through this area. I'm not sure why you're saying that. And this is someone who's holding, uh, you know, holding a swing trade from some 60 points below. And I'm looking at this as a day trader and I'm expecting this resistance to provide a six point 
opportunity or rotation, uh, counter rotation against the trend or something like that. So if you're trading in a group, you really, we really need to know what the other person's time frame is. I could be long, you could be short. We could both be making or losing money. I've said this many times, and it just depends on when I close and when you close, when you open it, and when I open the trade. Time frame is really important. I see a lot of people posting. For example, uh, I see some journals and futures IO. I get an alert. New journals formed, and the the trader uh, neglects to state what time frame they're trading in. Without that, I have no frame of point of reference. It doesn't really. I, it's hard for me to learn from that because. I really don't know how big a picture they're pulling in, what their context is for their trade. So define everyone's time frame. Speaking in different time frames is confusing, is confusing or misleading at best. Define focused hours. In other words, there should be a period of time when the group is only discussing market action. Do not talk about the football game. Do not talk about Real Madrid. Do not talk about you know some some adventure at a bar somewhere during these hours. These are focused, deliberate trading hours. Define those. Define what is worth looking at. In other words, is 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 information that we're looking at or we're sharing is it worth it? Is it just noise? If somebody's constantly discussing impeachment or they're discussing Brexit, but you really everybody in the in the group is trading you know whatever uh gold you know day trading gold maybe it's not relevant maybe it's not something you need to uh, chime in on it's not really important um and so create a focused dedicated environment this is what uh, convergent trading is about um understand what those uh, who are talking are using as cues, do they match yours? So we should have a pretty good idea, uh, and I'm really big on this, uh, we should have a pretty good idea on about what the other people that we're, we, we can hear or listening to, we should have a pretty good idea uh, what it is they're looking at. What are they queuing off of? You know, is this is this a trader that's looking at internals, so they're looking at, uh, advanced decline or, or breadth on the New York Stock Exchange. Maybe they're looking at advanced decline on the New York on the uh, Nasdaq. Maybe they're only looking at the S&P advanced decline, um, and and so on. Define what that is. We, as a group, as a tribe, if we're closely linked, we want to know. Like uh, you know, the prop shop I came into here in Chicago when I got into futures had about 50 traders, but I really only talked to about 10. The people who surrounded me, who are immediately to the right and left of me and across the table, you know, the, the, we had monitors back to back and there's somebody on the other side. You know, I understood these guys. I knew who these guys are, the head trader that was closest to me. I understood he traded the Euro stocks. I understood what he uh, was queuing off of. We had discussed his, his approach. And so when he shares something, I take that in, I take his context, context and his cues into account. Do they match yours? Things we can all do to get the most out of belonging to a tribe. Okay, so last thing, connecting with other traders can be a way to cut the learning curve tremendously. Now, I've talked a lot you know, for about a half hour and <laughs> it's everything I've shared here pipes into this particular statement. Connecting with others can really cut our learning curve but we have to apply ourselves in order to be able to, to get something out of this. People oftentimes join me uh, at Convergent and, and they leave. And the reason they leave, they're upset because I don't have a live screen and I'm not sitting here talking through every trade. That's not the purpose of the service. The purpose of the service, uh, I'll discuss a little bit later, it's not to, to give you trades. It's not to hand you a sheet with supposed setups. This is not the goal. Uh, but, you know, coming in, preparing ourselves as a professional is, is a big thing. So set some ground rules on what each trader has to come with. Like looking for some way to, con to continuously develop as a group, continuously, pardon the error here, 
continuously develop as a group, what are the common weaknesses? You know, we should know if I'm in a Skype group uh, or, or whatever, Discord channel or whatever, if I don't understand what everybody's coming in with, uh, it's hard to gain that. It's tough to do it electronically online, right? It has to be led by someone. Um, so what's everyone's weaknesses? What expertise exists within the group? You know, if somebody, I love knowing that, you know, some of the head traders at CT are options guys. You know, I, I'm, I know options. I understood options. I passed several exams to be licensed and I understand options in general, but having an options person, it's great because they can tell us why, for example, the 3300 level or the current Dow level, the 28,800 level, why is there so much chop around these levels? We've chopped around this level all day today, uh, you know, February 4th. 2020. Now look at the chart and it's just trading sideways around 3,300. Now this is a very big strike price. It's a, it's a bit of an option play. There's some delta hedging. What is delta hedging? And so on and so forth. Uh, so find out what the group's strengths are and have those people offer out that expertise. You know, talk about what they're doing. Give them a stage or a soapbox to, to speak on or to speak from. Come with a plan for our trading strategy and risk. Look, if you create a group and you don't bother to put together a trading plan that you bring with you, it's com completely useless to the group and ultimately it'll be useless to you as well. It's really important to come in with some sort of a plan. And that plan, at a minimum, has to have some sort of a trading strategy. And you can find out if that trading strategy as an edge or not with the group, that's fine. You can simulate it, walk forward or whatever, get help back testing it. And a risk plan. Without those two little components, it's really not a useful endeavor for everybody. So what else can you throw in? A trade management plan, very important. A money management plan, also important. A, uh, a journal that's ready uh, to to take in and track uh, what we're doing and a trade log that's tied to the journal that tells us here's what I did and then the journal tells us what the setup was and why it did or did not work and what action item needs to happen to correct this, what areas of improvement need to be corrected and then you, we can lean on our tribe or our group to help us figure out what they're doing different and what may help us as a as a as a tool because other people know something that we do not right the other thing is setting goals right set your goals put them out there you you know maybe sunday night you look at your performance for the week you figure out okay my performance is this here's my performance put up a chart put up a spreadsheet whatever it is and then set goals and make it known this helps in the accountability side of things. Very important to put that out there. Without sharing our performance and telling people what we're doing, even if it's on a simulator, just be honest with yourself. Unless, of course, this is a hobby and it's for entertainment purposes only. Um, we need to share our performance and our goals because that helps others kind of see what we're doing. Uh, how, you know, the performance should be shared on a daily or at least weekly basis. How did each person do versus their goals? What went wrong? How do we improve? At the end of the day, what we're going for here is consistent improvement. That is the, the theme for me this year. That is the theme for convergent trading this year, consistent improvement. Even if we don't end up making money by the end of the year, we have come a long way by taking on inch by inch, a small scale of improvement, every week so that when we look back, we see that we've, we've gained a lot of ground for the time and maybe the losses, the financial losses in terms of costs, maybe actual trading losses that we've incurred, right? So that's, I know this is really not sexy stuff, but there it is. Before I wrap up here, uh, I wanna make sure that folks know, you know, Bringing people together is a big, big thing for me. This is why convergent trading is named convergent, as in the definition is bringing together a point where people kind of come across each other. For the last two years, in March 2018, uh, convergent trading was launched. 
and much of my time and attention goes to it. I don't tweet as much as I used to because I am in that uh, in the chat room uh, discussing the markets as much as possible. There's a lot going on. I have many, many projects going on, things that are coming uh, to help traders as much as possible. Our focus at Convergence, a dedicated head trader channel of uh, seasoned professional, professionals discussing context and market action. There are other channels. There are channels for each market segment, you know, indices, uh, European markets, uh, energies, crypto, so on. Uh, there are two times a week online trader development sessions. Uh, Thursdays are study halls. Uh, this is where we, there's, there's organ, you know, uh, prepared instruction. And then on Tuesdays are our trade talks where we answer questions, look at things, look at the market as a group. Uh, there's a professional news feed included in the community membership, and there's access to just months and months of hours of videos and how-to sessions that date back to the very beginning, two years now. And then we have updated market stats that are run by one of our members, uh, who's also a team member of Convergent, uh, runs the stats and gives us the latest and greatest in terms of statistics on various markets. So I don't remember how many markets we have, but I'm thinking seven or eight, something like that. If you want to get in, get in contact with me, convergenttrading.com forward slash contact. I'm happy to help if I can. If I cannot, I'm going to do my best to direct you to someone else in my network who may be able to do that. That's what I had for you. Um, Terry, do we have any questions we uh, want to address here? Uh, let's see. We through and see. I probably added a lot of noise by asking <laughs> questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say right now. It says, I'm in the UK on the South Coast and looking to take a small office on, but would like to connect with another trader to share the office. How would you reach out? I, I'm assuming to find another trader to share an office with. You know, uh, I have to say that this is a pretty cool opportunity for FIO um, to have almost like a forum uh, topic or whatever it's called to kind of link up traders. Uh, I, 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 you know, you we do this search, in Convergent as well. If you search on the forum, I remember a meetup thread, but I don't remember again what was in there or where the people were at, but I remember different groups of people meeting meeting up in real life. So yeah, you might look on the forum uh, and see. I would say uh, if you want, just take this address down, convergentrading.com forward slash contact and just drop us a note. Uh, we have a lot of members. We have uh, hundreds of members. And uh, what I can do is try to help you by um, just posting it and, and letting others know. We do have our own little form as well for members only. And uh, in it, there are meetup uh, channels, uh, and we can just say, you know, tell us what city you're in or town, and uh, we'll see if somebody's close by and we'll try to get you hooked up, okay? Uh, okay, there. How does a trader improve their discipline? Uh, by doing the same, do, by identifying the shortcoming breaking it down into small manageable pieces. That's a very important part. And then taking the small pieces and just pecking at them bit by bit by bit. This is how we gain discipline. Discipline ultimately is like a muscle. You know, if I've never bench pressed before, uh, I can't turn around and look at some awesomely cut guy in a movie with a huge chest and say, oh, that guy's, you know, benches 450 pounds and go rack up 450 pounds at the gym and try to lift that off the rack. I'm not going to succeed. But if we learn the form and we start with just the weight of the bar, 45 pounds, and we, we do it properly. And then the next day we add five pounds on each end and do that and then add another five and then another five and another five and so on in a disciplined way. Uh, with plenty of rest and protein in between, uh, we, the momentum of our success, seeing that we've gone from just being able to bench press 45 pounds 
to now being able to bench press 145 pounds, that momentum creates a whole lot of discipline. It really feeds the motivation to keep doing what's right. And I think a lot of the battle, there are a lot of things I've struggled with in my life, and this is my own personal experience. A lot of the battle is just having the motivation, the momentum to just keep doing the right thing. If I came along and rewarded you by paying you $1,000 for doing something that's kind of difficult that you would never do on your own, and then every time you did it, I gave you $1,000, after a while, I actually don't have to give you the $1,000 for you to keep doing it if you see an additional benefit, if it's changing your life. And I think that discipline is just a muscle. We, we have to start small, find a little, you know, I want to improve my overall health. Heck, I don't need to go out and run a marathon tomorrow. All I need to do is go out, uh, you know, make it a point to drink a, a liter of water in the morning, to pass on the buttered croissant uh, after that. And then after that, maybe I'll uh, skip breakfast and do some intermittent fasting or whatever. Things like that. Just start small. Something that's almost a joke in terms of uh, a change that we make. And you'll find that you, with the success, the discipline comes on its own. That's been my experience. Okay. Uh, if you're not trading in front of a group, how can you learn? Um, I mean, people learn in very different ways. Um, you don't have to learn in a group. As I said, it just depends on the person's character. Um, but trading in a group, I feel, I believe is just efficient. Like, for example, I've never traded online alone when I was learning. I traded among professionals. Uh, when I started trading in Florida, coming into the office meant that I'm driving or I'm walking by a parking lot full of BMWs and Mercedes sports cars and Ferraris and Porsches and whatnot. You know, and I walk into the office and these guys are very serious and they don't have a problem telling me to shut up when it's impacting their performance. So I've never been in an isolated environment, but it, it can be done. It just depends on your character. But, uh, you know, you start out with the, the traditional way, books and things. Don't expect to learn anything from a book, but books are an amazing way to generate your own ideas, assuming there's a base of knowledge there. Uh, so pick up the basics, you know, the, the stage two of competence, the second stage of competence uh, from a book and the ideas that come from it may be something that you, you can uh, pick up on, but uh, every, people learn in different ways and it's just a function of the person's character. I say we all learn better in a group. I truly believe that. Uh, he says, I have a very good proprietary software and edges, but need other traders to share with, but don't want to give away my secrets. What do you suggest? Uh, don't talk about your uh, edge. Um, by the way, even if you shared your edge, almost everybody's not going to be able to duplicate it, by the way. It's very hard to it's very hard to take what you're doing and have spent countless hours putting together and believe in and um, and believe in and it, it it's it's and 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 execute it in the same way. Uh, Richard Dennis made this claim. With the, in the first Market Wizards book back in the 90s or something. Um, so I would just, if you don't want to talk about your system at all, talk about your performance. You know, come in and bring your ideas about performance. You know, the more you're, I, I've, I've seen this many, many times, the more we are engaged, the more we get out. The more we're, we're offering, the much more we get back. Uh, and so, you can still participate and you, there is still something in there for you without having to sit here and say, yeah, you know, well, I look for when the tick crosses a zero line and I'm looking for this special setup and on this pattern and that's when I enter and here's how I manage my risk and here's my exit and here's how I manage the trade. It doesn't have to be that detailed. It's you don't have to give up an edge, your edge, just because you're joining a group. You're joining a group simply to talk about the markets in general. 
but how you execute is something you keep to yourself. It's still a beneficial thing. You still have some things you struggle with despite your trading system. So talk about that. See what others are doing about that. All right. He asks, how do you best stay focused and not get distracted when you're waiting for the market? And I want to add to that, especially when you're in a group setting where you not don't end up distracting each other because you're bored waiting for something to happen. Yeah. So this is where um, this is where I said define hours in which uh, the the talk has to be market related, right? So uh, at convergent, we say this thing. We say because you can't. Uh, members cannot type into the head trader channel, only head traders can, but members can type in the global indices channel. And sometimes it kind of turns into uh, too much noise because people are just narrating stuff or whatever. And we have a lounge for that. Just like in a prop group, uh, when a head trader talks, everybody else listens. Uh, and then we separate the prop group into our global indices desks, uh, desk, our interest rates desk, our energies desk, same process. And so the information being shared on that desk needs to be focused. If it's not something you're willing to shout out in a prop firm for everybody to hear because it's you believe it's useful, then it really shouldn't be shared, especially during the, the defined hours. Um, but we also have a lounge channel. This is where you can go and tell everybody your latest joke. This is kind of like walking outside of the trading floor and going into the lounge and just kind of hanging out with people. Uh, this, you know, this is this is uh, this is human nature. If you're waiting uh, on a setup, um, if you're waiting on a setup and you're not someone who's a, who's got to watch every tick, uh, you can do many things, right? You can set alerts to the areas that are close. If I'm looking to short 3306 in the S&Ps and the market's climbing, I might put in a uh, an audible alert, text alert, whatever uh, at 3303 or the cross at 3,300. So I can get back to my seat and give myself time to, to look. Um, you know, one thing I do is I read a lot. On the, on the side of the screen, I look through certain blogs. I catch up on certain, I catch up on things relating to the market, especially I'm on this big macro, um, macro kick, global macro kick, where I like to read about what's happening in the repo markets and things like that. So I have an eye on the market. I do use Audible alerts. And it keeps me engaged. I don't have to watch every tick. Um, and, and I also have alerts for when things make new highs, new lows, or when a rotation is extraordinary. In other words, two sigma or better. Uh, then I, uh, it, takes, it gets my attention. It takes me less than a minute to kind of figure out what the context is so that I can engage with the market if I need to. Many ways to do that. You don't have to kind of blabber. Um, and distract other people in a group if if you're waiting for your setups. There's plenty to do. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think you've answered most of these. One thing I want to say, Terry, an underrated exercise and tool that people don't use that can be done alone or in a group setting, very useful in a group setting, especially if someone in a group is an expert on that product, is replays. Replays are so important. You know, finishing the day, knowing what you needed to do for the day, finishing the day, going back and replaying tick for tick what the market did and going through our notes to see what we did versus what um, what we said we would do and what the market ultimately did. This is a huge topic of discussion uh, in a group, right? So we used to record, we used to use Camtasia to record the screen, we'd play it back and talk about it, things like that. These, you know, there's a lot we can do in a group. Um, and, and a group is just a sounding board. Even if it's someone who's having the same problems is also losing money learning, also has um, anxiety or anger uh, or whatever. Even if you don't have to trade with a person who's you know swinging a thousand lots in the S&P to see improvement, 
by virtue of being in a group, by virtue of being together, we, there is a certain amount of accountability. We don't want to be a fool who shows up, says they'll do something, and then day in, day out, we keep doing the same stupid thing and having to talk about it again and again. There's accountability no matter what when joining the group, in my opinion. And replays give us, an, give us a chance to talk very, in a very focused way about the market and see what the other people saw in that moment or didn't, what you saw versus what they saw, how come they made money, you didn't, that sort of stuff. Very important tool. I wanted to throw that in there before we finish up. No, I agree. And if you think about every professional type of organization they have was they have a debrief after something, the military sports, after the game, after the mission, they sit down and they say, this is what worked. This is what didn't. And this is where we can improve. Exactly. So, like a postmortem is, is, is that's what a journal is great for. It's a postmortem to see what could have been once the day is done and over with what could have been done better because the goal is to, improve every day right that's our only goal is to improve every day if we're not improving every day it's we're wasting our time absolutely all right i think that's it uh thank you for the webinar the information and then for as always uh, spending some time with us this evening very cool thanks for having me on uh hopefully you all gain something thanks for listening in i'll catch you soon take care